55 um, from the break, and then we'll transition into a question and answer period for the panelists. Uh, and then lastly, we will participate in a community discussion. So this will be a time where people can share their experiences, um, successes, ideas, and uh, so forth. Um, and at the end, we're going to take a quick five minutes just to do some wrap up. Um, okay, so we'll begin now. And Karen, uh, on to you. Everybody, nice to see you all. Um, most of you, I think I've met many of you actually. So it's, it's great to have us all together here today. Uh, to talk about this very important topic. For those of you who are not very familiar with Core Alberta and the Community-Based Senior Serving Sector Development Initiative, I'll just give you a quick five minute overview. I'm hoping that many of you have been attending events through Core, so this will be familiar context and uh, sometime soon we won't even have to do this anymore because you'll all be familiar with this work. As you can see, Core is part of a larger community-led provincial initiative that focuses on developing a coordinated community-based senior serving sector in Alberta by bringing together community-based organizations such as yourselves around a common vision and framework for action with a focus on healthy aging and community and supporting seniors to live in their own homes for as long as possible. A strong and structured sector will allow CPSS organizations, which are very are best positioned to deliver critical services to seniors in the right place and at the right time, to do so in a better coordinated and resourced way as well as at a larger scale, ultimately enhancing the health and well-being outcomes for seniors in Alberta. The Healthy Aging Core Alberta platform is a member-based digital knowledge and learning hub designed to support this work of coordination and strengthening the sector by connecting community-based senior serving organizations and their allied partners, and by providing a digital space to share knowledge and capacity building opportunities like we are today, as well as to find and collaborate with others with aligned mandates. CORE is primarily a network and sector building tool aimed at supporting the creation of connected and coordinated provincial community-based senior serving sector. This provincial initiative came about as a result of a number of CBSS organizations and government partners jointly recognizing that the lack of coordination between CBSS organizations and within the sector um, was an opportunity not to be lost. The fragmented nature of the current sector in Alberta hinders the ability for larger systems, such as the health system, to collaborate with the CBSS sector as a whole and to create investment and service delivery efficiencies that result in large scale positive changes for older adults. Based on this, in the winter of 2019, the CBSS sector engagement project was undertaken and CBSS organizations across Alberta were consulted on this challenge. The community consultation process resulted in the What We Heard report. You can find a copy of that on CORE if you haven't already seen it. The report captures the strong desire for greater collaboration and coordination within the sector and with other systems, as well as a roadmap outlining the necessary steps to take in the journey in developing a sector in Alberta. Due to the pandemic, CORE Alberta was prioritized as one of the first activities to undertake related to this work due to the critical need for CBSS organizations to communicate, collaborate, and share information during these unprecedented times. With Core Alberta running for close to a year now, our focus will shift back to executing on the CBSS sector development activities related to re-engaging with community, all of you, and inviting broader and more active participation from across the province in the development of this initiative. Please stay tuned for upcoming development on this work, developments on this work in the next few weeks. Um, you can check out more information on the CORE Alberta website. I hope you're already signed up for the newsletter. If you're not, please reach out to Miriam and Cindy and Dana and the team at healthyaging at calgaryunitedway.org. This gathering this morning is a great example of how the CBSS sector can come together to find solutions and coordinate around critical issues related to the seniors that we serve across Alberta. So thank you again for being here and for your willingness to invest your time and energy. I'm going to pass it back to Dana. Thanks so much, Dana. Thank you, Karen. Um, and so now, without further ado, we're going to move on to our panel presentations. Um, as I noted before, we have four panelists that will be sharing information about their organization's work and experiences related to social isolation and loneliness. Um, we just ask that you please make note of any questions you have for the panelists and hold them until the Q&A period during the second part of the session. I would like to introduce our first panelist, Svetlana Pavlenko from the Jewish Senior Citizen Center. Thanks, Svetlana. 
Good morning, everybody. I hope you can all see me. If not, you have a wonderful button on your right top corner, which called view, and you can choose a speaker views and you will see me a little bit larger than everybody else. So um, I would like to start my presentation um, from some statistics. So when we are talking uh, about statistics and mental health in Canada, there is a quite a threatening statistic that one in five Canadians experience some form of mental problems every year. And uh, according to um, research from university, McMaster University, uh, 2019, almost 3 million Canadians experience some form of depression or mood changes. Statistic Canada also collecting their data and according to their statistical data from 2020, one third of all Canadians of 65 years old or older experience some form of depression. And there are quite a number of statistical data and uh, research from all over the world which connecting depression and mood changes with these terms which we are discussing today social isolation and loneliness. Because uh, of my first um, in line position, I would like to start with definition of these terms that we will understand if we uh, will explain social isolation and loneliness as a synonyms, or there are certain things which help us to put them aside from each other. So when we are talking social isolation, it's rather, um, quantitative term. It's defined how many social connection particular individual has or has not. And it's basically just giving us statistical data. When we are talking about loneliness, it's more about our feeling. It's more about us. So loneliness, it's our personal individual perception. How, not how many connections we have, but how is a quality of our connections. So loneliness, it's more personal, individual, and it's definitely negative perception in our life. So that is why when we are talking like social isolation and loneliness, we will understand that loneliness is something very close to our heart and social isolation is something that helps us to understand overall picture in the world, how people are connected with each other. Uh, when we are talking about loneliness and social isolation, we are talking about different factors, why we experience it and why it's happening, especially now due to COVID-19 measures, which are aimed to um, you know, prevent the spread of disease, but at the same time create a lot of negative impact on our community. And one of the things which um, are very, um, interesting in the modern world, it's a concept of mental traps. And we, you will be surprised to see how many mental traps we're experiencing in our day-to-day -day life. And the major traps we all have in our life, it's a three things. We all sorry about our past. We all worry about our future. And we are not grateful for our present. And according to the statistical data again, and quite a number of research, our day-to-day -day thinking process consists of 80% of our worry about these three things. So one of the things we are trying to do in our day-to-day -day life, it's try to help our clients and our members to recognize the presence of these mental traps in their life and to recognize the ways how they can deal with them and minimize their impact on their mood and their connections with other people. Of course, there are quite a number of uh, factors which we can't uh, fight with, uh, which definitely lead us to loneliness and social isolation. Um, for example, losses in our life. And by losses, I um, understand not only the loss of dear uh, people to our heart, but even retirement is a big loss for majority of people who are going in this stage of their life. You know, of course, health declining, it's a big uh, impact on uh, our perception of world around us. And in Alberta, you know, it's a wild west, 
for us, driving is so important that majority of older adults who are losing their driver's license experience immediate uh, feel of loneliness and social isolation due to the lack of opportunities to get out of their um, residence. Uh, I also would like to point it to you that even we understand loneliness as a, a lack of quality um, connections in our life, I would like to give you one wonderful quote which we believe in in our organization. So loneliness is not lack of company. Loneliness is a lack of purpose. And we believe that the main goal of our organization is to create opportunity for our members to find the new purpose of their life. For example, you know, we are creating a special support group for six weeks or for longer time where people can join um, either in a format of closed group or in a um, format of open group where they can share their experiences and seek for advice of their peers. Because we believe that peer support is one of the most important things, especially in a time of you know, extreme social isolation and extreme loneliness. We also create quite a number of uh, special program for intellectual stimulation because again, Many research prove that intellectual stimulation help people to um, revisit their purpose of life, find new interests, find new friends, and prevent social isolation and to reduce the feeling of loneliness too. Um, in in a um, guidance uh, we received for our panel, um, we also were asked to see how we can measure the impact of all our programs which we aim to reduce social isolation and loneliness and i will say that um, perhaps one of the major criteria we use is how many activities person actually uh, participated in and the second one is a very important one because we believe that seniors organization and especially senior centers where people coming for day-to-day -day programs not uh, living with us. Uh, the word of mouth is very important. And one of our criteria for success is how many new members the person who joined us brought with them. Uh, of course, you know, um, we initiate a lot of volunteer opportunities, even now, you know, when we are unfortunately closed and we don't um, do like our lunches and other activities uh, inside of the building, we are trying to connect people and we have like, groups of volunteers who are calling people, we're having groups of people creating a special Zoom meetings for people not only to talk or have phone, but actually see each other. And one of the challenges we experienced at the very beginning of our transition from the real world to the virtual reality, of course, it's a lack of desire of our dear seniors to use gadgets and to use technology. So you can see that I'm almost gray, so it's a result of our connections uh, of new technologies to our members. But we were very lucky because um, even though we had quite a resilience and uh, um, lack of desire to connect, uh, and hope that we will be back to normal very soon, uh, we, we were able to connect almost 80% of our members. The 20%, unfortunately, you know, still using only phone technology, not even smartphone, just landlines. But we are trying to stay in touch with them and we are trying to maybe um, find out the way how we can connect them still to the virtual reality in our center. So I think that I will stop here because I'm sure it will be quite a number of questions in the end of panel and I will be happy to answer all questions. So thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you. Thank you so much, Svetlana. Um, next, we're gonna move to Heather Rowland from the Senior Center Without Walls. Hello, everyone. I always joke that because I run a virtual program, um, but an audio based one, I'm actually grown allergic to PowerPoint. So I'll just be chatting and hopefully explain and give you the real feel of what it might be for our participants. So a senior center without walls is not something that we made up. It's a model that has existed in North America for the last 
goodness, probably 16 years getting its start down in New York, moving over to California and then making its way north to Manitoba where um, some folks from the Edmonton Southside Primary Care Network stumbled upon it and thought this, this is what's needed. Um, that initial push was mainly made from clinical staff actually, nurses who were working with seniors out in community, um, some of which were able to do home visits and were realizing that through these visits, through these interactions, what was needed by these patients was social interaction. It wasn't necessarily medical intervention. So we got our start and I was brought to the lovely province of Alberta uh, about five years ago through a federal funding with the New Horizons and a collaborative initiative with uh, several other organizations who I see today on um, in within Edmonton. And really what we wanted to do was quite simple at its core. We wanted to create a telephone-based senior center, something where people could join from the comfort of their own homes that didn't require any fancy equipment or anything like that while they, in order for them to join. And something that was interactive, engaging and meaningful for our patients. And we, have grown so much when we started. It was me and I ran two programs a week and we have since grown. We offer programming Monday through Friday um, about four, three to four times each day. And we offer our programming in three main segments, I would say, of topics. We offer health and wellness information, um, taking advantage of our connections within the healthcare system to bring on dietitians, exercise specialists, nurses, um, behavioral health consultants, um, that support for our participants. Um, we have programming that is, of course, just for fun, um, bringing in museums from across Canada, uh, playing lots of games, read aloud short stories, book clubs, writing groups, lots of fun there. But we also do skill building, whether it be new language development. Um, for a while, we were working on English, English practice for uh, second language learners. And we we really want to make it a menu that individuals can look at and choose what works well for them. Um, we use a lot of different methods to find our seniors. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest barriers I'm sure all of us face when working with socially isolated individuals is it's really hard to find them but we rely quite heavily on community partners, um, individuals who may have only one point of contact, who maybe were referred to a program but couldn't come in person, as well as our contacts within the healthcare system, getting referrals directly from physicians offices and uh, multidisciplinary clinical staff. And, that was all well and good when we were working within Edmonton. And then our definition of what Edmonton was got a little lax because we were getting calls from people outside of Edmonton going, I have this, this client, I think they would really benefit from your programming. Can, can they come? And so we started going greater Edmonton area. And, and then we realized that we should just say anywhere in Alberta because that was where we were getting to. And we saw the opportunity there, especially for folks who lived in more rural and remote communities who maybe didn't have as great internet connections and only had a phone. And so uh, we made that change in early 2019 and we were just hitting our stride with um, organically rolling that out and trialing it. And then COVID hit. And suddenly, um, the years that I had spent previously trying to convince people that virtual programming for seniors was a great idea, um, I didn't have to do that work anymore because everyone, they got it. They knew it was needed and it was very much so needed. So we 
we kind of switched gears a little bit when COVID hit, um, knowing that we had built up at this point four years of knowledge of things that worked that didn't work. Um, and the fact that there were a lot of organizations who had capacity to be doing lots of great work virtually with their seniors. So we worked at sharing those learnings, putting together a toolkit to help others get started and to convert some of their programming. But at the end of the day, one of the core elements of our program is that we are a platform that hosts programs. And so we love partnerships because we have about 2.0 FTE assigned to this project. So if we were to be running and creating programs and doing one-on-one -on -one support for all of our, at this point, about 200 active participants and then additional semi-active or newcomer participants, it would be a lot. And so we love working with partners in different areas, in different subject areas, as well as expertise, interests, and we love new ideas. So when we are working with new, new agencies, if they have a need that they've identified within their group of seniors or an idea of something they'd love to try, we are all for it and we love coaching and getting it up and running and running it on our platform as a collaborative because that way you don't have to pay for the tech it's all part of ours and your seniors also then have access to all of the other topics as well so that has really helped us expand our offerings what we're doing and it's really helped our team acknowledge, respect, and, and meet the needs of seniors who in and of themselves as a group are incredibly diverse, and we want to respect that. Barriers with this, um, it can be, it's a little bit easier nowadays, but in, in the beginning, it was really hard to kind of sell to people the idea that you're going to be in your own home and join a group of seniors that you've never seen before. But in some topics, it actually became a benefit that they didn't have a visual component. Things that were on sensitive or stigmatized topics such as mental health, grief, you know, you may not feel comfortable going to an in-person support group. You may feel a lot of anxiety about that piece. However, when you're in your own home and you're just a voice and a first name on a phone, it feels a lot safer. We also saw a huge income discrepancy when it came to accessing internet and computer. We learned very quickly that we had to ask the right questions because if you ask someone, can you use the computer and the internet? We got a lot of, yes, I can. Do you have regular and reliable access to a computer and the internet in your own home? No, often income related. There have been some things we've tried that have just fallen flat. Uh, we've tried some men's groups specifically, didn't really pan out. Um, not that we're not willing to try again. Uh, we have other topics that we have tried that have just flourished. And some of those are because of the partners that we have brought in. One of those would be language specific groups. We saw that there was some necessary cultural competency that was needed in order to work in individuals first languages and so we actually brought on partners who could do that um, right now the franco-albertan um, federation for uh, seniors here in edmonton is running a french language version of our program connect and aid and they have seen great success and growth and we also trialed some uh, Cantonese and Mandarin out of the Calgary Chinese Elderly Citizens Association. And that has just taken off as their center had to be shut down, but their volunteers and their um, organization has just flourished with that program. And we're so proud of them. So we, we did 
well, I'm a bit of a data nerd. I will say that right off the bat. So measuring our impacts was always top of my mind, especially as we got our funding initially in grant situations. So we have done uh, pretty rigorous pre-post evaluation studies of our seniors. Um, We've split it by their level of participation as well to see if there were differences in those that were our high need users who we saw multiple times each week and maybe our low users who we saw once a month or so. And we did see statistically significant improvements. Across, um, we saw improvements with their attitudes towards self-realization on the CASP 12 um, quality of life score, which is feel they don't feel they feel less left out of things, and also towards their energy levels, feeling you know they they're more energetic and feeling things they absolutely look forward to. We saw significantly statistically significant improvement on feelings of being valued by friends, families, and acquaintances. Again, that piece, I think Svetlana said, the purpose, value, they bring something to the table. We also looked at um, EQ5D quality of life, which is more of a health score. We weren't sure if we would find anything, and we were shocked to find a statistically significant decrease in anxiety and depression within our population. And looking at the UCLA loneliness score, um, we saw in all of our participants, we saw a decrease in feelings of social isolation. Um, and for the total UCLA loneliness score, we saw a significant increase for our high users who started at the worst scores and ended up with the best scores. So, we are, are thrilled by those results. We're working, they're um, being peer reviewed right now. And so hopefully getting published soon. And we are always looking for new partners. We want to expand. We want to help other organizations reach their seniors that maybe have difficulty accessing traditional programming. And we want to get creative and work with individuals on their ideas and the needs that they're noticing in their communities. So that's kind of our next step is um, to get out there a little bit more in the Alberta communities. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, we're next going to move to Jessica Cherowski, who's going to be presenting on the Rural Mental Health Project here in Alberta. Good morning, everyone, uh, and thanks for being with us today. Um, I'm just going to take a moment to pause and take a deep breath before transitioning to the next present, because it's just a lot of information I know that's being, um, uh, and I'm going to have more information. So um, if you want to join with me, uh, we can breathe in for three seconds and then breathe out or four. Um, All right, I know in our training, we do seven hours plus on Zoom and sometimes having a mental moment for ourselves can be nice uh, just to reground. All right, so my name is Jessica Trosky and uh, it's great to be with all of you here today. Um, so on the next slide, what I'll do is I'll start by talking a little bit about um, who we are. So I'm part of the Canadian Mental Health Association, Alberta division, um, and our vision is for mentally healthy people in a healthy Alberta. Uh, so we're the provincial branch, so we use more population and public health approaches to mental health. So we do more work through, um, you know, health promotion, community development, training and advocacy, where we're looking more for upstream approaches to make more system wide impacts to mental health and well being. So we ourselves do not provide direct services, uh, but we work with uh, many different partners, including the CMHA regional branches. Um, and other partners who do provide uh, different types of services to leverage their efforts. So on the next slide, I'll talk about the goal of the project. So our goal is to work with up to 150 rural and remote communities to build better mental health for all. Um, so this is ultimately supporting a mentally healthy community, which is not a checklist that's been predetermined by CMHA. You know, you just do these 10 things and you're mentally healthy. Uh, instead, our approach encourages people within rural communities to come together to define what does a mentally healthy community mean to us, and given our local priorities, our history, and our context. 
So we're achieving this through three goals, uh, three, three pillars of action, which I have a little icon on the screen for you to help follow along while, as I speak. So the first is around uh, training and funding. So we work with local community-based organizations to help us identify a community member who's interested in helping to facilitate a local group to come together to take action. These are the people we're calling animators. So we provide that person with training and funding to support them to get started in their rural community, or if they've already gotten started to continue working on what they're doing. Um, and what the training does is provide with different mindsets and tools to help animators discover who is in their community, you know, whether it's municipal leaders, schools, fires, uh, fire EMS folks, uh, seniors, moms groups, workplaces, whoever is a reflection of that community, and to bring them together to move the conversation forward in a way that's relevant for their, their way of working um, and their priorities. The second pillar of action is the Rural Mental Health Network. So we appreciate that training doesn't stop when, or uh, learning doesn't stop when training is over. Uh, learning continues as we each are taking steps in our own communities and lives and how we apply things and how we perceive things. Um, and so through the network, animators can stay connected to one another to continue to share ideas about what they're learning and what they're doing, um, as well as brainstorming and collaborating around challenges and opportunities as they emerge. The network is also about leveraging other provincial and regional partners uh, beyond what CMHA offers uh, to help better connect rural communities with additional resources, services, funding opportunities, and so on. And then the th third and more new pillar is our community grants. So we offer uh, additional larger community grants to uh, further support animators um, and their community action teams in um, act in implementing the ideas that they are wanting to um, support to help transform and support better mental health. So on the next slide, I'll just briefly mention, uh, because it's quite important, <laughs> uh, that we, we all appreciate that rural mental health or mental health in general is a complex issue. So when it comes to simple or even complicated problems, those can be solved with a best practice or a formula and maybe some level of expertise. However, when it comes to complex problems like mental health and in rural areas in particular, there's no one single solution that will address the complexity of all the mental health and all the mental illness related issues that everyone has across the province. So instead, we are intentionally navigating this complexity uh, with a principle driven approach where all the principles are applied differently, maybe based on the community context factors, but they're built on a foundation of evidence and experience. Uh, so what I'll do on the next slide is uh, touch on each of the principles really, really briefly. So the first is around being community-based or citizen-led. So this includes meaningfully being involved um, and involving people across different sectors and across different areas within the community. Uh, the next is strength-based. Um, and Cindy, if you can click next, thanks. Uh, thank you. <laughs> strength-based. So uh, being strength-based is not about being naive to the gaps and the challenges that exist, but it's instead investing further into acknowledging and celebrating the great people and the great work that's already taking place in our communities and building and strengthening the connections across the great work so that we can have a greater reach overall. The next is five of five. So as Svetlana had said, one in five people experience mental illness and five of five people have mental health. And so this Corey Key models, which you may be familiar with, is just our representation of saying mental health is more than the absence of mental illness. And we want to consider both the prevention and management of mental illness, um, as well as you know, whether that's services or screening. And we want to build tools and supportive spaces to grow good mental health including social connections. Uh, the next principle is around having a whole community approach. And the model here is our eight domain model, which we cover in training. And this uh, principle is really about considering all of the different systems and interacting systems that are already impacting and shaping our well-being, um, where services is one slice of that. Um, but we can also consider our basic needs, like housing and food, our livelihood, whether that's volunteer or work. Uh, lifespan development. So how are we connecting with seniors and uh, adults of different ages and youth and early childhood and so on and so forth. So how do we work across all of these different areas to find new and creative spaces and gaps between them? Um, so then the next and final one that I'll mention here today is around being developmental. 
And this is really just about appreciating the cyclical nature of this type of work um, and that priorities emerge and change over time. Uh, for communities and for individuals. If you think about what your priorities were when you were 18 um, versus if you're 55, they're, they're going to be different. And so no one approach can stay the same. It needs to continue to grow and change as we grow and change. So what I'll do is walk through a few details. Um, so first is what are animators? So um, I, I won't go into a great amount of detail here, but um, similar to when it comes to films. Um, an animator is somebody who is being able to bring color, energy, and action to mental health that weren't there before. So they physically live within the rural community and they aren't meant to be a manager or coordinator, but instead to be a facilitative leader, someone who creates and inspires the conditions for community empowerment um, done by building new relationships and processes. So what communities do in their, uh, what animators do in their communities differ in each community as they're each unique. However, there are common elements across out on all animators, like engaging with a broader group of um, professional and non-professional community members, and to help facilitate a discovery and dialogue that's guided by those principles that I've mentioned. Um, and they can do this because they receive training and funding along the way to support them. So the next thing I'll mention uh, is the community action team. So this is the team of people that animators bring together that made up of people that reflect the community values and priorities. Um, what community action teams work, how they work, it may be formal like a coalition, but it also may be informal like a wellness network or another term that they sort of want to call themselves, where people are maybe meeting in the evenings and the weekends, and they don't want to be considered a volunteer because that will make them run and scream. <laughs> um, and the important part here is that this is not about having another interagency meeting or interagency coalition, those add value, but their focus is primarily on service. Whereas this is around having community leadership being part in deciding and implementing and learning together. Um, and the last feature here about the details uh, is around the backbone organization. So um, each animator is supported by a local community organization that can help identify somebody in the community. And they also receive funds on behalf of the animator and distribute them to the animator as needed. Uh, so on my last two slides here, I believe, um, what I wanted to do is share some of the different approaches that communities are taking. Um, so these uh, on the left hand side, if you notice the similar colors to our domain model, um, these are some of the uh, priority areas that 31 different rural communities are focusing on. So as you can see, social connections is the most common local priority that communities are tackling, along with building well-being and improving services. Um, and other projects that are being funded with our community grants include community hubs, um, encouraging connection and kindness, uh, supporting parks and interactive walking trails, uh, men's mental health with a lot of focus on men's sheds um, and youth mental health, as well as different public education and awareness. So on my last slide that I'll speak to, what I wanted to share is some of the learnings about isolation that we've uh, been able to reflect on as a team. And this really aligns nicely with what Svetlana and, um, oh, and Heather already shared, sorry. Uh, so first is that uh, experts help at key times as they're needed, whereas within community, social and peer support are required for all of us all the time to sustain our overall well-being indefinitely. So social support is a protective factor that creates resilience and helps us overcome stress and challenges as we face them day to day. And the medical system can solve medical issues um, and support the treatment of mental illness, uh, whereas within a community, we can strengthen community's muscle to reach in and reach out to one another to be each other's supplemental or primary support that we all need. Uh, second is that community well-being improves throughout time if we're able to use collaborative processes that invite more people to invite them into sharing that leadership and um, visioning, as well as using processes that are respectful and that listen and validate people's experiences, perspectives, and their contributions. Um, third, which is, I would argue, most important here, um, is our own self-development, self-awareness, and self-care. Um, so really that we can't help others if we're neglecting ourselves, and we also need to include knowing our own boundaries, what type of social connections we already have, and what level of commitment we can also offer other people um, given our time.
Uh, fourth is that we also need a mix of strong of a different type of social networks where we have strong and weak ties. Uh, one person can't be everything to us, even though we often sometimes think one person can do it all. Uh, but we can gain a lot by having some close friends and some friends that maybe we have weaker ties to, like the people we see at the store in our neighborhood or along our walks. Um, and lastly, around I want to give an example around Devon Kindness Initiative. Um, it's an example of multiple interweaving strategies that invite youth, senior, local woodworkers, grocery stores, um, and others to be part of creating community wellness and connections, where the principle is really about that acts of kindness can have a big impact on both the giver and the receiver. Um, and it's a really simple method by which a pe everyone can participate in positive behaviors using acts of kindness to raise awareness about our own well-being and mental health. Um, and we can show kindness in everyday life, um, you know, saying hi to someone or taking the time to give someone a call or stop by. So um, I'll stop there because I don't want to go any more over time. Um, and then there are a few additional slides there that you can check out if you're interested that will be sent out if you're wanting more information. If you're wanting to get involved, I recommend going to our website, ruralmentalhealth.ca, um, and you can check out our map um, and sign our, uh, fill out our expression of interest form. And I'll stop there. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Jessica. Um, next, we're going to move to Robin Hewings, um, who's coming from the UK to speak about the campaign to end loneliness. Um, hi, thank you very much for having me. It's a real privilege to be here. Um, I, um, um, I don't have, what I want to do is talk for a little bit, and then there's a couple of things that I would like to illustrate with a couple of slides uh, towards the end. Um, so just to introduce uh, the campaign to end loneliness. We were founded uh, about 10 years ago. And um, what we do can be is kind of essentially is in three words. The first thing we try to do is try to improve the evidence about what can be done about loneliness. And that's both about trying to work with uh, academic researchers on that type of evidence. But we also think that a lot of what you do about loneliness is in the kind of skill of and um, details of delivery that we've just been hearing about. And that's actually where something where the, the knowledge that we're trying to share is between the different organisations that work on loneliness. Um, and the next thing we do is to try to bring those different organisations together um, to share that knowledge, to create those con contacts so that people can join up to, um, to better tackle this issue. And finally, we try to make the case for action on loneliness. Um, and I think we've, what we've been trying to do over the last decade is um, turn this from being something that uh, was just this kind of emotion to something that you could actually do something about in an organised way. Um, so I was asked to talk a bit about barriers and also about some of our recent projects. Um, and I've tried to pick out three main barriers. And I think that the first barrier that we've been facing, um, which has got a lot better, is um, taking this issue seriously. So uh, my old boss, uh, she was on one of the main radio programmes in the UK, and she was saying that, you know, loneliness was a really serious issue and it could even have effects on people's physical health. And the presenter laughed in her face because the idea that this emotion would have this effect on people's physical health in 2011 seemed kind of preposterous, really. Um, but I think that that just illustrates the extent to which um, our understanding of just how deep loneliness goes has really moved on. Um, and it's something, and in the UK, we've also been helped uh, by it being something that the government has taken up and that there is uh, a Minister for Loneliness, there's a loneliness strategy. Um, and that, you know, has not solved all of our problems, not by a long stretch, but it has at least got people to take it seriously, and particularly through the, it's, we've had that for two or three years now. And um, through the pandemic, it's been helpful for helping um, loneliness to receive funding and the issues with loneliness to be well understood uh, right, at, right across government. And so it has helped us, this issue to be taken more seriously. Um, and I think the 
uh, then the, the next barrier that we face, and it's something that people have mentioned a little bit already, is that it is not easy to measure. There are a few different measures. It's always a little bit hard to know if different people in different times and places uh, respond to those questions in exactly the same way. And it can sometimes be hard to get um, people to um, to ask the questions and not feel that it's that those it's quite these are quite sensitive things. Do you feel that you lack companionship? Um, do you feel do you sometimes do you feel left out? It's quite a hard question to ask unless you've got a good rapport already. Um, um, but um, but it's something is a particular focus of the government strategy to try to measure it more so that we could try to understand uh, what works more. Because I think that's the other thing is that we're really very much in the early stages of understanding what to do about loneliness. Um, there's a lot more that we need to understand. There's a lot more that we need to know. And then it's brilliant to hear uh, about the people who have just been talking, who have been measuring using the UCLA score um, and, um, and, and seeing impact on it. Because it's a big, I think the other thing as well is that um, it's a big deal to shift a loneliness score. You just think that, if you say that you feel that you often or always lack companionship um, and that someone who you don't know through a service uh, of some description helps you to say that you rarely feel that companionship, that's an extraordinarily deep change in your life. Um, and I think it's something which we shouldn't presume that we can always have radical impacts on loneliness schools because um, it, makes a, it, it takes a lot to shift them. Um, and then the final thing I think, is, which is a barrier, is that it needs action right across society. It's something that we can tackle in our own lives. It's a job for charities and different bits of health and local government. Um, and there's also a way in which um, kind of national, the UK is obviously a very, relative to Canada is a very small country and a very centralized country. Um, and so the, we would see that as a big role for national government, which I guess in Canada might be more seen as being something as much for provincial government as well. Um, um, so, so yeah, so those would see, I see the barriers and some of the ways in which we can, can, can deal with them. And I just want to briefly talk and hopefully I will catch up a little bit of time as well about two things that we've done recently, which I think are, uh, interesting. They kind of fall into that kind of evidence camp of things that we do. Um, and I'm just going to share my, my share, just a couple of illustrations really just to, uh, help show what, what I'm talking about. Um, so this slide is just about, it's about some ways in which loneliness can make you feel. And I think that for many of us here working with people who are lonely, these words will, um, will hopefully have resonance. Um, and what they, and these are drawn from the kind of uh, qualitative academic literature on loneliness. Um, and I think what they show is some of these words cut very deeply, things like feeling lost, uh, feeling anxiety, feeling a kind of emptiness. Um, I think it just kind of gives you a sense of how important loneliness is and how, what a big effect it can have on us, um, which then sets up what I want to say next, which is um, that because these are such powerful emotions, um, they can then, influence how we think about our social interactions more generally. So for example, um, people um, uh, think if you're feeling lonely, you think about your other social interactions much more negatively often. Um, so um, you, you know, in general life, people might forget to call you back. You might make a joke that didn't work. Um, you might be a bit scared about going into a new situation, but if you're not lonely, it's much easier to brush those things off. Whereas when you are lonely, it's much more difficult to do that. And then the danger is, is that you then withdraw even further, um, meaning that people get into a downward spiral that makes it very hard to get out of. Um, and what we with using that insight, I think it helps us to really think about what we do about loneliness. Um, there's a long, interesting report you can go and read on our website, which I would, which you 
urge you to do, which talks about some psychological things you can do about it. But I think what this does uh, more slightly more practically is it shows firstly why we can't just presume that if someone's lonely, they'll do something about it and sort themselves out. Actually, being lonely is something where there's a really strong case for supporting people. And secondly, that when we think about what we do about loneliness, we need to really bear in mind that doing new things, going into new groups, um, uh, or even just staying engaged in places that we're already, uh, things that we're already part of, will be more difficult. And we need to think about how we make sure that if people, someone comes into a group, that they're made to feel welcome and secure rather than potentially excluded. Um, but that's just a, a, a little taste of what I hope is a slightly a much richer report. Um, and then the second thing I want to talk about is something that we um, did to just try to think about all of what you can do about loneliness in an organised way and develop it into a framework. I'm not going to go through this in all its detail. I just want to pick out, just very briefly describe it and then pick out a couple of uh, uh, highlights. So, uh, or kind of lessons from it. So kind of starting from the point of view of someone who is lonely, um, and again, we heard this earlier, it's hard to find people and finding people is a really big part of what we need to do. And there are different services that can help us um, reach lonely people. And I think, um, which can be through primary care, it can be through different ways in which people come into contact with services. Um, uh, but then the key thing to do is to understand their loneliness because loneliness is so individual that there is no one thing that you can do. But it is likely that if someone is lonely uh, and is chronically lonely, that they will need more than just a, uh, a slip of paper and told where to go, that they will need some kind of active support. And um, I said earlier that we had a loneliness strategy and the biggest and best thing in that has been a kind of a rollout of something called social prescribing, which is in uh, the health service that helps to, based in primary care, to connect people who have, who are, presenting in primary care um, but actually the real driver is to do with kind of social needs rather than medical needs and it's about connecting people to the resources and assets in their community that will help them to um to to to, to deal with those needs but also mean that they're less in uh health care um which it creates some kind of financial win-wins in a very stretched uh system um, and then there are things, and you can, if you look, if you're looking at the slides, you can see that obviously, if you can't get the bus to the social group, that's a really very obvious issue. And um, as I say, brilliant to hear about the telephone services, which can provide some ways around both that issue and also that digital can also be a way that something that excludes people. And finally, we think that the, the environment you live in if, can make a big difference as to whether there are whether there are places where there are places to go, if you can get about, but also if you feel safe and welcome. If you people don't feel safe and welcome, that can really drive uh, um, a lot of loneliness. Um, moving quickly onwards, we know that groups can be great ways of dealing with loneliness. Sometimes one-to-one -one services uh, like befriending can be useful, particularly for people who are not able to access any other forms of support. And we think that there is a role for dedicated psychological support to help people be less lonely. Um, but the key lesson I want to draw from this really is that these are all really different types of services and that there is no one solution to loneliness. Um, but equally, if you, it doesn't, it, what, the other thing which I think is important to say is that because there's no one solution, it means you don't have to do it all. Your service won't be the thing that can solve loneliness in your community, but what can be really helpful is to connect to those other parts of the jigsaw that can help you to better tackle loneliness. Um, I think I failed in catching up with much time, but I hope that's been useful. Um, there's a lot more on our website. You can sign up to our mailing list. We've got a rich programme events, also trying to put together what we've learned about COVID, what's happened in COVID, and what we want to happen next coming up uh, through the summer. So um, I hope that's been useful. Um, and uh, it's been great also to hear about the work that's happening um, in Canada and particularly Alberta.
Thank you so much, Robin. Um, now we're, um, we're going to um, next move into the Q&A, but first we're gonna take um, a quick five minute break, a bio break, if you'd like to um, you know, grab a glass of water or, or do anything like that, you can. And we'll, we'll see you back here um, at 10.05. Thank you, Dana. While we do that five minute break, we also have some polls for those who would like to stay. We do understand that Zoom can be tiring. So uh, we want to make sure that you have time to process the presentations and just prepare for the next part. So I'll let Miriam um, pull up the polls for us as we start the break. Thank you, Miriam. Thanks, Cindy. So I just launched a poll. We are always curious about where folks are joining us from. I realize we had some folks joining us um, not uh, in Canada at all. So um, perhaps you can at least tell us if you are joining us from a rural or urban uh, region uh, where you are. And I'll just give this a few more seconds. And yeah, for the folks that would like to take this opportunity um, to just take a break and process, uh, please feel free to do that. Numbers are sh still shifting around a little bit. So I'll just give it a couple more seconds and I will end the poll and just share the results. We have a lot of folks from rural areas, which is really encouraging to see because um, there's obviously um, a lot more sort of lack of access um, in those areas. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. And as you can see, we also have a distribution uh, around the different areas in the province. Um, a lot of folks from the central area. So thank you for that. I have a second poll just on the type of organization that you are part of. Um, if folks could take just a few seconds to respond to this poll. Just give us about 20, 30 seconds to respond. Lots of folks from healthcare so far. Lots of senior serving organizations. So I'm just going to share the results of that. Uh, so senior serving community organizations, healthcare, government, social services, as well as some representation from um, immigrant serving organizations. So thank you so much for that. And just the last question, we have a little fun question for you. Uh, Cindy likes to throw these in because she is a fun girl. <laughs> Thanks. Dana also helped me make this one, so <laughs> has her flair. Awesome. So what's your favorite hobby during COVID? I am still in the bread making era. <laughs> I have a new interior design persona. I am a certified Netflix connoisseur or other, and please feel free to share your other in the chat. Just give folks a couple more seconds to think about this one. And there we go. <laughs> I think folks are over bread making, which is, <laughs> yep, Netflix is still going strong. Um, and folks are, are people sh sharing things in the chat. Here we go. <laughs> Ooh, all sleeping. Yes, that is my forever hobby. <laughs> Inflicting arts and crafts on the neighbors. That sounds fun, Jody. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be your neighbor. <laughs> yes, plants. Everyone is uh, climbing their green thumb. <laughs> Sleep. <laughs> right, Charlene? You need to catch up on that. <laughs> and lots of walking. Yes. Reading. <laughs> yes, I agree. Food as well is critically important. 
Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. Ooh, horseback riding. Let me get into that. Thanks, everyone, for playing along. And uh, I will let us get back to the program. Yeah, so um, we are going to move into the question and answer um, period here for the panelists. Um, just given the time, we'll maybe, um, we'll see how many questions we get and then um, if we need to cut the next uh, portion of the community sharing shorter, we can do that. Um, or maybe we'll just kind of nicely transition from here into there, into the next. Um, and so I'm just going to open the floor up um, for any questions that anybody had for the panelists. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll leave it uh, for you folks. And I believe we had some questions that we'd kind of written down um, as well as we'd been presenting throughout. So we can always go back and revisit some of those questions as well. And so if you don't mind, uh, Dana, I'll just jump in quickly. So some folks did ask about um, just the presentation presentations on whether would, they would be shared as well as the contact information of the panelists. So there will be a follow-up email uh, where that information will be shared, it will also be shared on the Core Alberta platform. Um, and Jody, you had a specific question just on the list of uh, communities um, that do receive um, rural mental health uh, projects, or sorry, they have rural mental health projects on their way. Um, and I wasn't sure um, if uh, perhaps Jessica, you wanted to speak to that piece. Absolutely. Um, so what Oh, I can do if it, if I'm able to share my screen or if we wanted to go back to the slides. I've, on our website, we have a um, map here um, that I'll let me just if I can. Yeah, I can share my screen. Um, so these are there's um, 99 communities involved. That number is going to be going up as we have new training starting this week and in two weeks from now. Um, and so if you click on any of the communities here, you can um, click to see which community and who the animator um, and plus one are there. So that is a helpful tool if you're wanting to connect specifically with somebody in your community to see if there is an animator or a neighboring community if you wanted to work as a region. Um, so that is one option. As for the communities that received grants, I actually do have a map of all the communities that received grants. I'll just need a second to pull that up out of my files um, and I can share that. In the meantime, if there's other questions, feel free and I'll, I'll grab that as soon as I can. I will share that information as well in the follow up email, just for folks. Um, I did have a question for Heather. Um, I'm just wondering for the senior center without walls, you talked about kind of how your geographical location that you serve has expanded. Um, do you, like, is there a point at which you think you'll end up um, sort of cutting that off? Or do you think now that everything has moved virtually, um, you'll be able to kind of take on um, a wider region? No, that's a really great question. And I think there is no logistical reason why we would have to limit. I think there are things that would make it more applicable or, or better to serve the participants in terms of we, we really aren't just attend the programming and then you're done. We are a point of contact. We do one-on-one -on -one outreach and support. We, uh, I think Robin hit it on the head of the nail there when he said, you can't just give people a piece of paper who are, you know, experiencing social isolation and saying like, here you go, go sign up for this thing. It's a process. And we, we find that the biggest successes that we have with increasing our geographic region is when we can find partners who are activated within the community and are able to kind of provide that bouncing off point where they're doing some of the initial outreach and then doing a warm transfer over to us. We're then following up with that individual, you know, 
anyone right now, anyone from Alberta could Google us and say, yep, I want to go do this. But that's not how the majority of socially isolated seniors are going to get into our program. So of course we do get inquiries from all over the province of people who were just looking us, you know, looking up options because they felt ready to make a change or they were activated in some other way. We get a lot of referrals from like um, family members who are maybe doing that research and then saying, hey, my mom is in this tiny town in Vauxhall. Like, can you, does she qualify? And the answer is yes. If they're anywhere, if they're in other provinces, what we often do is we'll just connect them with the senior center or equivalent program in their area. We have quite a good network between the programs. And so I can usually find someone who can accept them and get them connected that way. But I think the real limiting factor and the thing that's kind of the black box in my mind is what are people going to do after COVID is over? Are a lot of the community organizations who have gone virtual, are they going to switch back to only being in person? Are they going to have some options? And what is going to happen to the people who were accessing these virtual programs and these increased offerings that are then disappearing, but they are still having those barriers to traditional programming? And that's really where I want folks to be connecting and saying, as you're making your transition plans, please connect your seniors to us. We're happy to do mixed models and we're happy to, to chat about that as well. Heather, there's a question from Tammy, um, just in terms of uh, connecting on a program um, that they are initiating. Uh, so the Wellness Connect program and that they would like your advice on that. So I'll let you uh, kind of connect on that piece and Tammy will just make sure that you have Heather's uh, contact information. Absolutely, Tammy, we'd be happy to chat about that. And um, yes, some organizations, it's more of an information sharing connection that we do. Others, in if they don't have all the tech pieces in place, sometimes they use our tech and they facilitate and sometimes it's a bit more of a, a mixed model. It just depends on what works for your organization and, and where you're at. Awesome. Thank you, Heather. Um, Jody had a question for Robin, um, just on has there been any research or programs that attempt to proactively present, uh, prevent loneliness? So example, targeting young seniors to be mindful of risk factors and what they can do to prevent becoming isolated, identify thinking patterns that accompany loneliness. Uh, yes, so I think that um, I've just popped an answer in the chat just so that the so that the link is there. Um, so I think that there's some things which are kind of in a way quite common sense um, that people can do um, in terms of keeping in touch with people, investing time in their relationships uh, and getting involved in different things like volunteering that can really help people to um, um, be be more kind of resilient to um, different things that might happen to make them uh, at high risk of being lonely. Um, but there have also been um, uh, this particular program that I think draw on, drew on some wider learning um, that uh, one of our uh, advisory group um, was very involved in, which was called Transitions in Later Life, um, that also draws, and there's some, also some other ones that we talk about in our uh, psychology report that um, that yeah essentially help people as it were um, uh, uh, in kind of younger later life to think about some of the transitions they might be going through particularly things like retirement um, and help and help them help them to um, have some ways of thinking and processing about them uh, those changes to enable them to um, better withstand some of the tests of resilience that people can have um, as they become older and potentially um, develop health problems or become bereaved or um, become more frail. Thanks so much, Robin. Uh, 
Pam, you had a, a question as well. I was just wondering um, if you might be interested in jumping on the mic or I can read it out for everyone. Um, and uh, she had a comment specifically about Senior Centre Without Walls um, and just that it's a tool that they uh, use for seniors in the North, um, but they have experienced some resistance um, for, from those who don't have the confidence to join um, and they support them by attending with them. Um, but no, not sure if there's more that they can do. And so she had a question for Svetlana. I'm just curious how you're able to um, entice 80% of your users to attend. So, you know, like um, before uh, pandemia, we already started to introduce a special courses for our seniors, um, how to use iPad how to use your smartphone and other stuff. And it was mega popular because, you know, children will buy their parents' uh, gadget, but they wouldn't have time to teach them how to use it proper. And of course, you know, you have to have like constant repetition in order to transfer it from the skill to the habit. And um, we spend a lot of time doing this thing. And um, later, we also purchase a few iPads. And what we want to do, we want to introduce it to people who never used gadgets before. So we will try to arrange like one-on-one -on -one meetings when it will be possible with all security and safety measures possible and just help them to understand this technology and then children can buy it to them or they can buy it themselves, depends on the situation. But for us, it was a very tough task. We uh, involved quite a number of young volunteers because you know usually when our um, people have some issues to connect or some issues to understand where to go, they will call to the office and office was overwhelmed with the number of calls like, where I am, where is this Zoom, how it's happening? And so we established a good a support network of youngish volunteers who were able to do a consulting on one-on-one -on -one, and it helped tremendously. And then, you know, we also just maybe a life hack. We always starting all our programs like 15 minutes early because it gives opportunity to people to see each other, you know, to chat for a few seconds and say, oh, how have you been? Oh, let's connect. Let's call each other. So we can see that like people really, really eager to make this like even a few minutes like visual connections in order to uh, check on each other. So it's just like very nice uh, addings to what we do in day-to-day -day life. And Pam, I just wanted to share, uh, thank you so much for calling with your seniors. Um, that's one strategy that we encourage if, if referrals are being made with individuals who we know may be experiencing some hesitancy or some other issues, if there already is a relationship there, you can build on that. Um, I really wouldn't want people to feel too bad about it though, because honestly, it is a process for a lot of individuals. They learn about it, they might not be ready, they might try it and then say no, and then two months later call us back and say, can I try it one more time? And so, you know, it, it's okay if it doesn't work the first time. It's We're never going to be upset if a referral doesn't go through and we actually keep them on our caseload for quite a significant period of time once they've been referred to us to just check in on them, to get them comfortable with us and to just see what's actually going on and what the barrier is. Like if it's a idea of overwhelming choice or not feeling like you have anything to contribute, we can as facilitators, maybe direct them to a program that would be a better fit for where they're at currently and then give the facilitator a heads up. So really trying to welcome them in. And yeah, there are some wonderful organizations out there. I saw some of put in the chat, cyber seniors and different groups that we've worked with or encouraged our seniors to, to reach out to, especially if it's a barrier such as hearing loss or, or something like that, we can kind of work with the individual to figure out what exactly is going on and how can we help them. It's not gonna be for everyone. Some people are gonna try it and say like, mm, not, not for me and that's okay. It's much better for them to find 
something that's a good fit and we're happy to continue on making those referrals to other organizations. Thanks, Heather. Um, just uh, with the time in mind here, um, I see one more question in the chat box for Robin. So maybe I'll read that out, uh, Robin. And I could um, ask it, is that from me? It's from Irene. I was asked if I could just ask him. Um, sure, hi, Robin. Um, first of all, thank you for your presentation. And just um, interesting for me was that it's 10 years running your, your programming. And I was curious, we deal with a lot of um, challenges of sustainability. You start something, it starts as a pilot, it starts out really well, but the sustainability of things that work is sometimes a challenge. So I was going to pick your brain to see if you could share any tips that might have been the most important things for you, given that it started from kind of a chuckle about loneliness being important to a 10 year running program, what made the most difference in advocacy? Was it a particular government official who had passion around it? Was it a certain champion in the community? Was it a tipping point of seniors kind of growing in numbers? Like what was it if you had a few things you could share with us as to how do you advocate and gain that sustainability of good ideas? Thank you. Um, so I think that what has helped us was that um, a number of organized, different organisations um, have come to see the extent to which loneliness was um, a really important frame for what they were trying to achieve and also that they could see that it was the driver of other issues. Um, so strong supporters of this agenda have been uh, as varied as um, uh, the, uh, the main professional body for general practitioners, um, because they can just see it in their surgeries. Um, the, there's a big retailer uh, here called um, The Co-op, um, which, and again, that was driven by, they run lots of local convenience stores and they could kind of see it in people coming to their shops three or four times a day who didn't really need to come to their shop but they could see that the reason why people were coming was because of loneliness and that that was a really big priority for the co-op. Um, I think um, we've also been fortunate as an individual organization, but this issue more generally uh, by the commitment over a long time of the National Lottery that funds a lot of community uh, organisations and work. Um, and, and the final thing, which in terms of why has loneliness become something that has a, uh, uh, you know, a strategy and it's uh, got someone who's called the Minister for Loneliness, um, is that, um, and it's a, it's a very difficult thing to talk about, but there was a, a new MP who took up the issue of loneliness when she became an MP in 2015 and in 2016 she was murdered. And I think that there was all of that widespread support and interest in the issue, but um, her colleagues in her own party, but other parties as well, I think really felt that it was so awful what had happened that they felt that there had to be a legacy for her as well. And so um, so it has, so I think that is also part of the story as to why um, this issue was taken up so much there. I think it is um, essentially it, it kind of, um, when people were looking how to, they could kind of recognize that they saw that this was an issue where the government could make a difference where you could do something that was really important um but some of the reason for why there's been this kind of kind of progress at the political level um in the uk does come from this absolutely appalling event um so i hope that's, that's a bit of an answer to a mixture of what's helped to sustain us but also to sustain um and grow interest in the issue of loneliness through this period Thank you very much. Appreciate that. I have one last 
a question here from Sharon in the chat. Um, she doesn't, she's not able to use her mic, so I'll just read it out for her here. Um, just one moment here. Um, and so this question is also for Robin, um, and she's wondering if the UK has started to embed loneliness into relationship education in classes in primary and secondary schools yet. Um, and she notes that this is so important that children learn about the value um, of social relationships. Um, so I think the answer is to a degree, but I think that there's a case for schools thinking about loneliness more deliberately. So we, so this organization, so loneliness in started off as being an older person's issue. Um, I think we've come to understand that there's actually an issue that cuts across all age groups. Um, but we as an organization um, have evolved in that way as well. But our kind of level of expertise in is greater amongst older groups than in um, than in children. So I think the answer is a bit, but there's a lot more to do on it. Wonderful. Thank you, Robin. Um, and thank you, all of the panelists for sharing with us today and answering all of our questions. Um, I'm just going to pass it off to Cindy here um, for some uh, wrap up for a final wrap. Everyone, thanks for your patience as I was fiercely trying to pull up the slides. But I just wanted to let you know and remind you all that after the session, we will send a follow up email with a link to a core post, which will house the session's recording and contact information of our speakers. Uh, the email will also contain a link to the survey, which I am also leaving in the chat here. We would love it if you can take a few minutes to fill it out so that we can under stand your experience today. Uh, thank you so much for sharing the space with us today. And if anyone would like to stay back and have a conversation with our speakers, we will be around until 10.30, so around three minutes, just chat it up. <laughs> so for everyone else, we wish you a lovely rest of your day. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.